mothers all these months. Uh, all right. So I'm on a two shot. Okay. And uh, so I trust you had a nice lunch. Uh, very rushed one. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was too. Did you eat here in the hotel? Yes, just uh, just in the restaurant. There. Yes, I, yes, I did too. Now, are you going to wear your glasses during the interview? No. Okay. I'm going to put it down. Yeah. Like this. As long as you don't forget them. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had um, we shot we're shooting in here one time and um, uh, the person that I was interviewing uh, was using a wireless mic and took it off and put it down and you can see how dark the carpet is and so when we were getting all our gear together and everything the microphone was overlooked Oh. and plus a big bag of cookies or some <laughs> some delicacy <laughs> and, and we said talk about a full service hotel you know? <laughs> okay Chen Kaiga, right? Yes, yes. Kaiga. That's my name, yes. Yes. <coughs> Welcome to Dallas. Thank you. I appreciate very much your coming here and giving me a chance to talk with you about your film together. I must tell you, first of all, that I am just addicted to classical music. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you can imagine, for me, this was the kid in the candy store <laughs> having a wonderful time with this film. Right. But having said that, and as much as I loved the, the music in this, uh, in your film together, uh, there's so much more to the story than the music. Mm -hmm. A wonderful father-son story, for one thing. When you were, as, as the co-writer, director, and uh, supporting actor, when you were getting the film together, Chen, what did you want to convey to your audience? Well, I mean, there's several things that I think I want to say uh, to my audience. Number one is, particularly, you know, for the Chinese audience, I want them to know that how important to have so-called high culture. Uh, I use my own experience, you know, to sort of uh, put into the film, like a father and son relationship. You know, many people knew in China that, you know, what happened between my father and me. It's a long time ago. I mean, it's, it's a, in the period of time of Cultural Revolution. <coughs> Can you explain what happened? Uh, yes, it's, it's a sort of personal story that, you know, I was, I was 14 years old, and I found out my father was in a big political trouble. And I was the best student of the class in the school. I mean, it's, I, I, was, I was studying in the best boys' school in Beijing. So I just... Uh, literally don't didn't want my position to be changed so uh, so when I was asked by the revolutionaries to say something bad about my father that I did so I generally speaking that I just uh, destroyed the relationship between my father and me you know uh, it's sort of public denouncing I must say you know it's a very tough experience in my life I was only 14 so that's, I guess that's one of the reasons that I want to make this movie. You know, I didn't really know that this is a story really about my father and me until the movie was made. You know, and then I just to try to remember what I said to my actor who played the father. That I, you know, I try to remember what happened in the scene that when boys comes back to see his father to say that I'm sorry that, you know, uh, I shouldn't make you angry and I shouldn't have sold the land in, you know. Those words are really from my heart. I didn't know that I did that unconsciously. Mm. You know, I think it's a very important message. I mean, it's a human story, obviously, you know. But the other thing, you know, for American audience, for Western audience, I really hope through this movie, they can see something they haven't seen in the past because a lot of change in that society. And I hope that the people would understand China is no longer a faraway country, and the people, you know, yes, culturally we're different, but we are same in human, you know, we are human beings. And I think it's, I mean, the other personal experience that I had in the past was that I was taught by my mother, who is a big fan of classical music, 
And she just literally said that, you know, I used to receive the education in the church school in China, but it's a before revolution. And she said that <clears throat> because we didn't have any religion in this country, then we, we find out that there is a strong connection between the Western church and Western classic music. It's nice to be <clears throat> educated, you know, to know something about Western classic music in order to have that kind of protection for yourself. I mean, when something happened, you need to be protected. I mean, she was right, actually. You know, during the Cultural Revolution, particularly when I would become very, very sad and depressed boy, you know, I'm, I'm looking for help from the classical music. I had very, very dramatic story to tell, like, you know, how a small group of my friends, you know, getting together to listen to the classical music secretly, you know, I mean, in a warehouse. Uh, I really hope that, you know, the music bring us the new hope for the future and help us to understand more about human dignity. Uh, dignity. I mean, we were ready to fight. That's what happened. You know. If you had been caught listening to the classical music during the Cultural Revolution, that was in 1966. Yes. If you had been caught, what would they have done to you? Well, you know what? I mean, what happened? You know, they, they found out we listened to that, uh, those, I mean, classic music records. They just uh, smashed the records in front of us those red cars who used to be my best friends, you know. All of a sudden, you know, just over, this is sort of overnight thing, you know, they're completely changed. They became very crazy, you know, I compare them with Nazis, you know. But what I have learned from that is that as I see how my records and the records from my friends being destroyed physically, I just say, no problem. You guys can do that. But you can't kill the music. Music is right here in my mind. You know, it's, it's, this is what happened. I mean, yes, they would criticize you because we were too young. They cannot really put us into jail. But I know somebody who listened to the Beatles at that time. Eventually, it's considered, you know, a commit crime. You know, that's a very, very tough time for everyone in China at that time. You know, the good news is that we don't really have that kind of problem anymore. You know, we can even make a movie like Together, you know, to show to the whole world that, I mean, how the Chinese people are fascinated uh, by the Western classical music. Yes. And maybe even the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm sure that many uh, young people are uh, in favor of, of pop music. They have the freedom to listen to it and create it. You know, I mean, I know some uh, uh, very important rock and roll uh, stars in China. You know, although that they're not that well known in the West, but they just insisted that this is what we want to do. You know, uh, that's beautiful. Really. How long did the Cultural Revolution last? I don't want to tell you, 10 years, you know, it's just decade. I mean, so that's why my people, you know, uh, in my generation particularly, you know, they feel like they lost a lot of time and it's a big lose in their life, you know. Maybe you can make more money, but you cannot make your life longer, you know. So that's why many, many Chinese parents have that kind of dream, you know to make their children somebody in the future, make them rich and famous, make them, you know, having something that they don't have, they didn't have in the past. That makes perfect sense, you know. Is it still today that there is no religion uh, practiced in China? Well, I mean, well, this is a sort of a I mean, traditional thing. Uh, I don't know the reason, really. I need to do a long time research to understand why Chinese people haven't been having a religion. I mean, some people are Buddhist. It doesn't really mean, I mean it's just the minority people believe in the Buddhism. <coughs> Most people don't. So uh, particularly during the Cultural Revolution, you know, the temples and church just being ruined. 
you know, in a very brutal way. Uh, no, yes, I think people have, you know, kind of a freedom to believe what they want uh, to believe, uh, but not majority people. You know, just to, uh, that's what happened today. Uh, I wish we could have something to believe in. Not necessarily particularly religion, you know, I mean, Roman Catholic or, you know, uh, Christian, you know, but we need, as a human being, we should allow ourselves to believe in something. There, I'm sure you know, Chen, that there are many philosophers uh, who believe um, that man has a spirituality and uh, that man, to survive, needs to acknowledge that and to um, profess it or acknowledge it in whatever way is, seems comfortable for him. So are you saying then that in China, uh, if, if you agree that man does have a spirituality, are you saying then in China that um, that is suppressed, that people suppress their spirituality? No, the thing is that, you know, uh, because that, uh, back to the 50 years ago, when the Communist Party took over there, so people believed that there is only one religion, which is Chairman Mao himself. And you have a believe in him. You, know, you have to treat him, worship him, you know, like a god. But after Mao died, and after you know, the big tragedy like Cultural Revolution, many people realized that it's wrong to believe in a person. You know, he, he wasn't a god, something like that. Then the problem is, the question is, who we should believe in, and what is our ni next idol we should worship? So far, we couldn't find one. <laughs> That's the thing, you know. Uh, so many people got, you know, strong feeling that they got lost. They didn't know what to do. And I think, and also because the economic change, you know, there's a still a very big gap, I guess, between rich and poor. And people just don't know. I mean, what happened here? So everything's changed. You know, we used to live in the quarter of our house. We say good morning to our neighbors every day. But now, there is no quarter yard house anymore. It's just a tall apartment buildings. You know, we hardly do have any neighbors, you know. The life, the whole lifestyle has been changed. Yes, that is uh, very apparent in your film. And, and where, where all did you shoot your film? Well, actually, the beginning part of the movie was shot uh, in a small town. It's a very nice, you know, with a lot of waters, and it's a little bit like Venice. I mean, that's somewhere close to Shanghai, probably two hours away uh, by car. I really enjoyed that kind of, you know, small town atmosphere, and people are nicer, and uh, life is easier, you know, life is really easier there. Uh, not like in big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, and the people ask me that, I mean, most of the time, you know, they see the image of Beijing, the people riding bicycles and so on. But I, I don't want to tell you, we got a two million cars in Beijing city. So that's why a lot of you know, traffic jams and so on and so forth. I mean, Beijing or Shanghai is no longer the way that the people used to look at. So it's a huge change. But some of the movie was shot in Beijing. In, in Beijing, largely, I mean, most, part of the movie, I mean, mm -hmm. it was shot in Beijing City. You have the most extraordinary young performer who plays the, the violinist, the, the prodigy. And um, it's my understanding that we see him, and he is certainly playing the violin, yes. but we are hearing another violinist. True? <laughs> it's true, yes. Well, actually, the, what happened was that, you know, uh, we did want to find someone who can play violin you know, uh, in the first place, before we make sure that he can act. So we were lucky to find a young boy uh, from a competition. 
You know, he was really the number five of the competition, like we said in the movie, you know. And then I found he's a very nice and quiet and shy boy, and, uh, and I talked to him briefly in Beijing before the decision was made with, with uh, his parents, you know, uh, present. Uh, I just found he's very nice. Although that he wasn't very happy boy because he's pushed so hard by, you know, basically his father to practice every day. He is not necessarily a, 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 a big fan of the music, really. No, he's not. Then, of course, now it's changed. It's changed, you know, uh, for good, really. Uh, then we need to find somebody who can really, I mean, consider as a genius to do the soundtrack. Uh, then we find someone in New York City. Uh, he lives there, but he's from China. He's only 22 years old. And I listened to her performance, you know, uh, just for five minutes, I said, well, that's him, that's him. You know, we must get him on board. And uh, we record everything in Beijing. It's really amazing. It's amazing that how good he could be, you know, as a, as a, as a player. Uh, then what we did is just play the music back on, on the set and just let the young boy to match with that. That's what we did. And I think they did very well. You know. Extraordinary. Yes. Extraordinary. <laughs> and I'm glad when I saw the film, I didn't know that the one we see is it's not is not the, the soundtrack that we're hearing. I'm glad I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's done an extraordinary match. Yes. I'll see the film again. Yes, Be please. I, I will. Yes. Uh, because uh, there's just so much to appreciate about that that film. Thank you very much. Really. And uh, let me check this one minute. Hang on, Fred, if you would please, one moment. Uh, repair the relationship with your own father. Yes, I did. That's another very uh, personal story. Like, because uh, I didn't know how to do, how to do, uh, uh, how, to, how, how to talk to my father after what happened, you know. And I guess he either, you know. Until one day that uh, uh, I, I, I was in the train station. So that's coincidence as well. I mean, I don't think it's really coincidence, but you know, uh, thousands of thousands, you know, teenagers um, ready to go to the countryside. They, they just uh, respond to the call from Chairman Mao go to the countries to receive the re-education from Chinese peasants. That's a very typical thing to do. You know, you got a no choice. You have to go. Then my father went to the train station to see me off there. You know, we sort of shake hands, you know, say something nice. Uh, I was already 16. Uh, then I got on the train, the train started to move. Um, then I just by chance look back to see my father running off the train. You know, obviously he didn't know that, you know, I was watching him. Then I cried immediately. I mean, I, that, then I knew that how much this man was in love with me, no matter what I did to him. Then I wrote a letter to him, you know, asked for forgiveness. Then he said, he said in his letter, that yes, I forgive you a long time ago, not because you are my son. But I, have, I forgive you and I hope you can do good because you're the hope of the family. He said the same thing as I decided to be a film director because he strongly rejected the idea to make me a film director because of the political reason at that time. And then He's a convinced this is what I want to do. So then he said, son, if you want to do it, let me tell you, the truth is a very tough job to do. But you will promise that we'll never give up. So that's why I'm still here. I'm still doing my own movies. And uh, 
I remember clearly what he said to me. I pretty often dream about him. My father already passed away nine years ago. But yes, I mean, I I experienced a lot of things, you know, even beyond people's imagination. You know, I was a lucky one who、uh, have so much love from my family, my parents, and the people around me. And I I'm determined to to give my love、uh, to my audience, to the people around me, and I I believe in love. I think that's the soul of any kind of religion.、Yeah. So, do you ever think about putting your own story on film? You know, just the way you've told it to me. Do you ever think about doing that? I I've been thinking about and make a movie, really, really about relationship my father and me. I want to do it. I still remember how I walk into the house where we live the night the terrible things happened. I can, you know, everything is in my mind. I think I can easily to visualize everything. I'd love to do that. Although there's still a taboo, you can't really, you know,、uh, to get on top of that, the cultural revolution issue, you know, because we're encouraged. To put what happened behind us, I agree, I agree. But not before we learn the lessons from that.、Uh, yes, w- soon later, you know, I I I, I can promise I, I'm going to do that.、Uh, I mean, I want to because it's a true story. I don't want to add anything in. You know, just make it as as true as possible. And would you likely play perhaps the father? And I'm not so sure. I need someone. I prefer to be. I prefer to be a, a director. Because maybe I will ask my son to play the part. He's still too young. You know, I I need to wait if we want him to be in exactly my age at that time. We need to wait for. Another eight years, something. He was too young. He was only six. He's only six. But I will find a very、uh, good actor to play my father's part. That's what I want to do. Well, if I may be so bold as to state an opinion, I think that your story on film,、uh, uh, told with all the honesty that you want to tell it. I think it could be a a great force for the world to understand what China has been through. Absolutely, I I can't agree more. That's true. I mean, this is a sort of、uh, the interesting,、uh, not just to know. I mean, something on the surface like what happened. I mean, as a revolution, and we wanted people to know. Really, what happened inside of ourselves? I mean, what is the psychological、uh, process that we've been through? You know, because my sister was asked to do the same thing, she said no. Because you know, she didn't believe that. You know, I mean, my father is guilty. I knew that. I mean, he was innocent. What were they accusing him of? No, just say he's a, a spy for the Nationalist Party, and he was counter-revolutionary. That's that's very common stuff, you know.、Uh, yeah, I, I think that will be very very interesting because I I think it's very very important. I'm not trying to tell. I mean, the things about my own privacy. I'm trying to reach people on a common level, because during the Cultural Revolution, I saw too many people, you know, get down on their knees, in the back for forgiveness. But after Cultural Revolution, so many people all of a sudden stood up and say, "That's not my fault. That's all other people's fault." So that's why, if you continue to be that way. 
you cannot avoid another revolution. That revolution, the mystic, can be you know correct only when people, more and more people, to stand up and say, "I take the responsibility. This is my fault. I will never do that again." So everything will be over. Not before that. Chen, this has just been the most fascinating conversation I've had in a long, long time. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, again, I will tell you how much I really appreciate and love your film. And I hope that it finds a very appreciative and large audiences in this country. Thank I know you. already it's been a huge hit in China, hasn't it? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Now, very nice now, to now, Okay. What is it you're trying to say to your audiences with this film together? What I'm trying to say is. That's good. Okay. Um, in what sense is this film autobiographical? Uh, you know what happened between my father and me is. Okay. Yeah. Exactly what did happen between you and your father? That is. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Do you have a patch up? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, I will. Thanks. I, I will get to that. All right. Where all in China did you film this movie? I, I shot in Beijing, uh, most of the scenes. Okay. As we look at the movie, does this truly depict how life is in China today? Yes. Did you ever have a chance to mend your relationship with your father? Yes. Um, okay. If they had caught you and your friends listening to classical music during the Cultural Revolution, what would they have done to you? Let's do it again. If they had caught you listening to classical music during the Cultural Revolution, what would they have done to you? Is religion being suppressed in China today? Now let me re-ask that another way. Okay. Do Chinese people try to suppress their spirituality? Yes. Oh, ever, one more. Thank you. We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> you know, we finish one another's sentences. <laughs> um, do you ever give any thought to making a movie about your own personal story with your father? Yes, I will. All right. 